Willisie film, Inside Morissette, has some scenes and dialogue of a graphic nature. They have been included in the special to preserve its realism and integrity. Some parents may wish to exercise discretion in regard to younger members of the family. wonderful bushland right on the shore of Lake Macquarie, only about two hours from Sydney. But as you look around this park-like setting, you start to get the feeling that something is wrong. You see people sitting quietly behind wire fences while the kangaroos hop around freely. Morissette may not look like a psychiatric hospital, but that's what it is, a place for men and women who are mentally retarded or suffering some form of mental illness. What makes Morissette special is that this is the place where other psychiatric hospitals send their most violent patients. And Morissette also has been given the task of caring for the criminally insane. For some, Morissette is the end of the road. But for others, it can be a sanctuary or an asylum, a hospital or a jail. Maybe just a place for time out. Step back from the pressures and regather your wits. As a nurse, Morris Brown sees them coming here time and again, sometimes willingly, sometimes not. All it takes is a certificate stating you are in need of psychiatric attention to remove you from the outer world, suspend your rights until you are assessed by psychiatrists and, if need be, magistrates. In the case of John, all it took was a violent outburst against his mother. Well, John, what have you been up to? Nothing. Nothing? That's not much. Nothing much. Oh, smashing wardrobes, smashing mirrors. Why have you been doing that? Because Mum got me frustrated. Your mum got you frustrated? Thanks, yeah. Mum. That's fine. I just, when the doctor rings, I'll find out if he wants to hang around. Your mum got you frustrated. How'd she do that? Just nagging. Nagging you. Mm. And have you been, <laughs> you've been in Curry Hospital for a while? Yeah. How Since long? Monday. Since Monday. Why, why did you admit yourself to Curry Hospital? I never, Dr. Wong did. Mm. I see. And what happened that they decided to send you down here today? Well, I walked out of the place today. Ah, right. Where were you going to go? I went home. Didn't have Got changed. Mm. All right. Well, while we're waiting for the doctor to come, we'll start filling in some of those papers. What do you think of coming down here? I don't know. I didn't like it last time, because there was nothing to get a punch in the mouth every day and put in the room and bash shit out of you. When you were here last time? Seven years ago. Eh? Yeah. Not in hard. this ward. No, no. Not in this what ward. What ward was that in? In 19. Was it? Mm -hmm. Find that hard to believe. Well, that's what went on. Were you misbehaving? Nope. I'd be doing nothing. They'd just come up and go bang. Would they? That's not nice, is it? No. Well, I can assure you that doesn't happen anymore. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> This is Ward 19, and it's second in notoriety only to the infamous Ward 21. Both hold the criminally insane, or patients with a history of violence. These men are held under strict security, and the nursing is hazardous, even though these men have improved to the point where they are allowed to leave Ward 21. Good morning, Barry. Some are so antisocial they need to be locked in individual cells each night. Most patients accept the routine and get up when told at 6.30. But not George. 
George always resists. Time to get up. Thank you, too close. <laughs> he once made a living out of fighting, and he is still belligerent. Time, George, time to get up, George. George, you gonna make your bed? Yeah, best I can, sir. All right. Best I can, up, cold. Both, sir. Both, sir, I got them. The worst. Here's another man named John. His thoughts often seem scrambled. He's had four strokes and his brain is a mass of scar tissue. She's gone. Just wait there for a minute. There's a nice cup of tea out there waiting for you. Yes, there's someone here waiting for you too. Come on, George. Sit up, mate. Come on, sit up. Come on. Keep me going, sir. Sit up, George. Get away from me. All right. Get away, you. I'll drive you. Come on, Ray. Get up. You don't make my bed for me. Well, you get up now. Come on. Not for missing a bed. Out of bed and get dressed. Come on. <coughs> get dressed now. Why keep waking me too? Come on, too. <coughs> make your bed. I'm a killer. After you get dressed. Come on. I've killed one. I've killed a man yet. I will, eh? Enough talk. Just get dressed. Come on. Big arm. You keep on waking me. Come on, too. In George's cell, his shoes and indeed all other objects are removed because he tends to throw them at those who try to get him out of bed. It's a tough ward, all right, but Nurse Les Wheeler is used to it and even seems to like it that way. He has a talent for a job that few could handle. We've often had phone calls from people saying, look, we can't handle this patient, he's built my staff up, we want to send him up. And we usually say to, her, say to them, why can't you handle him? But they hit us. We say, well, what, do you, what are they going to do to us? Same trick. He us too. But we usually manage it by talking down. We don't get too many fights between the patient's staff. Yeah, me, George. Come on, Come on, Come on, Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. You don't worry about it. Ron Jones, you're on diet. Thank you, please. You're on a diet. You're on a diet. You're on a diet. Next race. Come on. We have confidence what we can do. We treat them as men. More if you'd like it. More egg. And we often say, oh, well, if you want to be, want to act rough, we can act rough too. And they sort of look at you and say, oh, all right. And that's it. They're good patients. Right on the road there, mate. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where the patient come in from Kenmore is to bash all the staff up. He came in. He said, I'm not staying in this place. This place is a hole. I'm staying here and race for the fence. And uh, I was on his tail, and as soon as he turned around and realised on his tail, he was going to do me, you know, fight me. So he sort of um, threw a couple of punches and he ended up on the ground and he said, well, geez, he said, they wouldn't do that to me at Sydney Hospital or the Kenmore Hospital. See, we're willing to, to grab a patient and not just try to talk to him. If you can talk to him, you'll talk to him, but if you can't talk to him, we'll grab him. Physically hold him, restrain him. That's about what we do here. Come on, Georgie, I'm going to wash the veranda, mate. Come on. If a patient tries to punch it, you put your hand up, but mainly you sort of grab them. Not one, two, three nurses grab a person so you can't hurt them. You only have to do it once, and they realise it's your main business. Well, she's glad. Get a hand with this guy, please. Come on, George. We need you outside, mate. Better chance. Oh, no. Come on, come on. Come on, George. Come on, fight, George. Let me go here. I'll sit down.
Do you want you for me? You are dead. You get you bastard. You come back here, I'll you this tin, you bastard. I'll throw a load of you, you. I've been hurt myself. I've been off on compo. Broken ribs, three broken ribs. One punch, because I was tried to talk a patient down. So I um, ended up getting punched in the ribs. New Guinea originally. I was in an orphanage. I was taken out at about two and a half years of age and placed in a foster home with this Irish family. And then at uh, 10 they put me in a boys home. I came back to them for a short while and at 15 they asked me to leave. And I had no money, no food and no job. And this wonderful old lady up, up the road called Mrs. Allison, took me in and fed me and clothed me, got me a job in the railways. And so uh, I lived with her for seven or eight years. And then she died suddenly of a heart attack and I was out on the street again. So I was once again on my own. And uh, from there I graduated to jail. I uh, was doing 90 days for vagrancy and uh, I was homosexually attacked in jail, which is quite common these days and uh, the, the chappy who I was in the cell with did it to me and uh, we had a fight. I struck him with an iron bar and I've ended up uh, killing him and uh, I have uh, governor's pleasure now because they felt, the authorities felt that uh, I was mentally ill for what I did. Governor's pleasure can be a life sentence in the very real sense. It can go on forever. Already Laurie has now lived in Morissette longer than he has lived anywhere else in his life. And his story is one of the many puzzles with which I was confronted at Morissette. The very idea of a man going to jail on a vagrancy charge, being attacked in jail homosexually, and ending up here for so long, leaves a lot of questions unanswered. We sought the opinion of the hospital's medical superintendent, Dr Les Darcy, and with Laurie's agreement, Dr Darcy gave us his assessment. He um, has a serious psychiatric illness which is uh, under control most of the time with medication but when his uh, anxiety level rises his paranoid ideas come out again and he believes that there are plots against him and we're involved and um, he becomes very aggressive at times. He says that he got picked up for vagrancy yes. and things went bad when he was the subject of a homosexual attack in jail and then killed a man with an iron bar. Yes, well... Uh, he tells us that, the, uh, that he was uh, attacked homosexually, but in fact uh, other evidence closer to the time of the offence suggested that he believed at that time that the other prisoner had uh, put salt in the, uh, in the sugar container in the cell and uh, he was annoyed about it. Ward 13 is one of the two admission wards here at Morissette. If you're brought here, you may remain here or you could be sent to another ward dealing with special problems. But it's here that the psychiatrists and magistrates must determine at what point abnormal behaviour constitutes mental illness. John Stace has been here about three weeks now. It's not his first time here. And the story of how he came to be admitted on this occasion is, to say the least, unusual. I'd been all the way up into Queensland, up through St George and through the Moonies and out into Dalby, I was looking at a place to buy up there. Anyway, on the way back, it would have been about eight or ten miles north of my hometown, I ran out of petrol. This was all about half past nine or ten o'clock Sunday morning. Anyhow, I tried to wave some motorists down to get some petrol, I'm out on my crutches. Didn't feel like walking, it was only about four or five miles of a near a service station, I thought I could wave a motorist down to get some petrol. Nobody stopped. Anyhow, this is, like I said, this is about half past nine or so in the morning. Sit there all day, nothing to eat, cars going north and south all of the time. Dark comes, so I got a spotlight out. I had a spotlight in the car, so and I tried to wave some motorist down to the spotlight. Anyhow, they wouldn't stop still. So then I put my crutches out in the road and a couple of people stopped. Yeah, what's the problem? Out of petrol, mate. 
Oh, what are your crutches down on the road? I said, I put them there in the hopes that somebody would stop so I could ask for some help. Oh, OK, we'll see if we can help you. Yeah, a couple of hours go by and still no help come, so that's when I got the spotlight out and I had it started hitting people right in the eyes. But put my artificial leg out there and a big bus just ran straight over the top of it. Carved it down the road, <laughs> smashed it up. <laughs> Anyhow, next thing I know is a cop has come out from my hometown. Two of them, pretty stupid looking glass they are. Yeah, they carted me into the cooler, locked me up, and then next thing sent me down to my city. For doing strange things, I reckon. <laughs> I reckon they were doing strange things. <laughs> well, well, truck drivers, when they break down, you know, they put triangles out to show there's something wrong. So I put the, my leg out. Yeah, I reckon if I was uh, driving along somewhere and I seen an artificial leg out in the middle of the road or even a pair of crutches, I reckon I'd have to stop to see what it was about. Because it is strange. It's unusual. You don't see an artificial leg or a pair of crutches out in the middle of the road every day of the week. And if I, if I seen something like that, I reckon I'd have to stop to see what it was all about. Funny thing, that. I ran out of petrol, and that's what got me back in here. Uh, he's been here, I think, three times now. John, he, he, is a, a, he is a character. He's a very a colourful sort of a character. He, he does get ill from time to time, usually because he stops taking his medication. But when he gets ill, he does some fairly strange things that bring him to the attention of the police and the rest of the community where he lives. John's always very vocal and usually abusive when he first comes to hospital and rather difficult to take for a while, but generally after a few days and he gets back onto the, the medication that, that suits him, he settles down and John's, I find John quite a nice guy and a very likeable character, really. I've done some strange things. Let's say I've tried to be an individual. What? No crime strike tomorrow? No, it's no If you do anything no individualistic in this, in this world here, you've dubbed a nut. Dr. Darcy believes there is at least a little hope for each of his patients. Without experience, it's hard to dispute that. But walking in for the first time, it's very easy to get the feeling that many have close to no chance of improvement. They appear to be time servers. The drug trolley is the only persistent, evident sign of treatment. Mostly it contains depressants, downers, which are so strong, they would put most of us into a deep sleep. <laughs> but sometimes the drugs fail to work. Sometimes there are side effects. And when all else fails to arrest a deep, often suicidal depression, they send for this box. It sends an electrical charge through the brain. We know it as shock treatment. The hospital calls it ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. How long since you've had it, Ethel? Since Six you've had ECT? Four, four weeks. And four weeks, is it? OK, go to sleep in a few minutes. Mm. No one knows quite how it works. But in cases of depression as severe as Ethel's, a course of up to eight treatments does produce results. That's right, just like that. Be a bit of pace, give it a good rub in. Peggy has tried massive doses of ECT or shock treatment and medication. She's a manic depressive, which means that it's a continual challenge to match the dramatic changes in her mood with the required changes of treatment. Peggy, what happened to you that started it all? Well, I don't know. I woke up one morning and I couldn't go to work. 38 years ago. I was a married woman, I had a daughter eight years old. Very happy, had a lovely home and everything. I was a manageress of a chemist shop in the beauty section. 
I'd been there for, in that section for five years. I just couldn't go to work, so I stayed home, crying. I couldn't cook my dinner. I just went on and on and on. I let it go on for nine months and tried to take my life. With someone like, like Peggy, who's our resident manic, I guess you could say, she, her swings have become so close together over the years that, that even with the speed that we, we change a medication to, to um, accommodate her ups and downs, we still don't seem to be able to stop the actual swings in her mood. And when she gets really high, she's just a total disturbance to the whole world. She's, she doesn't sleep for maybe three or four days at a time. Her behaviour becomes very degraded and, and her personal hygiene becomes nothing. She doesn't care. She urinates on the floor. She defecates on the floor. She attacks other patients for no reason whatsoever, uh, physically as well as verbally. She attacks the staff almost continually. Um, Luckily she's getting old and frail now and she's not all that adept at attacking people but she still, if, you, if she catches you off guard, she pulls your hair or she scratches with her fingernails or, or whatever. It's, it, she's very, very trying and, and she's, as I said, she's like that sometimes for a whole fortnight. Peggy's moods are so extreme and so unpredictable that they defy preventive treatment. When she is depressed, the very thought of having shock treatment makes everything that much worse. Every time I need jock treatment, the first day I get depressed, I start deciding how I'm going to take my life. And I try, I don't, I try, I, I've stolen knives and they found them. And I've been going to commit suicide even up till yesterday and I get better so quickly. Just as quickly as it comes on, it goes off. Why are you frightened? Because I'm frightened that I'll start on it before I'm asleep. And I'll have it like I did in the old days. Without anaesthetic? Yes. What was that like? Well, can I move my hands? Yes, sure. You hit the ceiling, you hit the bed, you hit the ceiling, and you wake up. And they have two, down at Prince Alfred, they had two extras to hold you on the, on the bed. And you saw them when you went in. And they leaned over you before they gave you the treatment. Now I had ECT here. I had 12 here, I had six in Prince Alfred. I had 12 here before I decided they were going to give shock treatment with the anaesthetic. And it's really wonderful. I love going off to sleep, but I'm terrified until I start going off to sleep. And you can't do anything about it. Are you ready then? Okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. All finished. There we are, he's having yeah. a bilateral fit now. How many times have you had shock treatment? 178. How many? 178. It's a lot, isn't it? Too many. The last doctor I had six months ago said that I had 177 too many, and I was too old for any more, and it knocked my body about so much that I shouldn't have any more. How long have you been here now? Ten years. What do you think about the shock treatment? I think it's wonderful for everybody else. You don't like it? I think it's wonderful for me too. Would you like it again? No, never. You scared of it? Yes, I'm terrified.
biggest enemy in this place. Boredom of nothing to do. You just sit around all day or just pace the courtyard. That's all that's got me through. It's not allowing things to get on top of me. I just sat there, just, just fighting it mentally. There isn't an answer to the boredom question, especially in this ward, it's a very strong issue. There's no real answer to it. The only answer is for the nursing staff in the ward to do their best to find activities for the patients. Often patients are kept in the ward, you know, 24 hours a day. And to find someone that's something that interests people and can keep their interests is very difficult. Well, their attention span is usually very short. We find in reality that people do sit for long periods during the day doing nothing. Stephen is 21. He has a history of anti-social outbursts that get him into trouble with the police and he's on a three-year bond for smashing up a jukebox. With his record of instability, Stephen finds it very hard to get a job and he became depressed. He has come to Morris at this time on the insistence of his probation officer. What's this shit? Psychiatry, mate. That's a yeah, good all the problems. They wrote a book about me, did they? <laughs> I'd love to about you. We have to have a look and see if you can find yourself in it. All right. Where's personality disorders? Is that you, is it? Yeah, that's me. How do you know it's you? Because I was told so. Who told you so? I'm not saying. <laughs> do you believe it? Oh, yeah. Believe it. You've got to put some label on you. Do they? Mm. You know what it means? Yeah. I'm not telling you though. <laughs> you know what it means? You found it in the book? Huh? Have you found it in the book? There you are. Antisocial or asocial personality disorder. Mm. Antisocial individuals are always in trouble benefiting neither from experience nor punishment and maintaining no real loyalties to any person, group or code. They are callous and hedonistic, showing marked emotional immaturity of lack of sense of responsibility, lack of judgment and inability to rationalise their behaviour. That's not so you, is it? It's warranted, reasonable and justified to them. That's not you, is it? Yeah, that's me. It is? Yeah. yeah. And what about this here, eh? I'm getting, I'm getting Stelazine, which is for schizophrenia and a psychotropic drug, mm. and it said that people with personality disorders are said to have become more socially adapted to the of LSD therapy. All right, where's my LSD? <laughs> Like Laurie and so many of the people who come to these places, Stephen did not get much of a start in life. My grandparents brought me up, six months old. My real mother lives down in Melbourne, and my father, I've never met him. I don't know where he is, I'm not allowed to contact him or anything ever. His wife got a court order out for him not to contact me, and me not to contact him. Probably thinks I'd stuff up his life or something. Her life. If I just appeared on the scene after 20 years or something, pop me head up, there you go, old oh man. Thanks. This is Ward 21, and this is where they keep the criminally insane. In fact, that rather likeable young man we just met was placed here on a previous visit. But on that occasion, he escaped with two of Australia's most notorious criminals, Crib and Monday. And since then, they've upgraded security here, including the provision of this new electronic alarm fence. But coming here as an outsider for the first time, you certainly hope it all works, because it's difficult to come here uh, without a feeling of apprehension, a feeling of fear, in fact, because in Ward 21, there always seems to be an undercurrent of resentment and imminent violence. When I first walked in, a lot of patients avoided me. Some talked to me without looking me in the eye, an old prison habit. Only a couple displayed the sort of erratic behavior you might expect. 
Of course, all were drugged. I met only one man who was obviously anxious to get out. Do you think if all you live, you can take me with you? Well, I can't take you with me. They wouldn't let me do that. No, they'd lock the door. Against the law? Yeah. You've got to get better first. I offer you money. You offer me money? Oh, I can't take money. I can't get you out. When Crib and Monday escaped from here, they went on a rampage of abduction and rape. Crib was already a triple murderer. But now that the security is much tighter, perversely there is a greater degree of danger for the nurses or visitors like me. Several nurses told me they fear that any future attempt to escape would need hostages. And the nurses are unarmed and have no access to arms. Even policemen are not allowed to bring guns in here. The danger of a patient getting possession of a weapon is too great. These men are predominantly murderers and they suffer from mental illnesses. Walking among them, it's hard to face that reality, hard to equate your own fear and apprehension with the apparent calm of these prisoner patients. I've done 11 years all told. I've yeah. been over to the other side though. What happened? Oh, I uh, cracked up over practically nothing. It's just uh, went around the bend. A lot of people are here simply because they're not wanted in jail. They come up here and they get sick of a mirror and send them to jail and jail cops them for a while and sends them back. That's right, yeah. Why doesn't the jail want them? Because it's too much trouble for them, you know, they're not... Uh, not a fit for it. Yeah, they uh, don't fit into the prison system properly, you know. Mm. They're not uh, tractable. In Morissette, progress can be slow and tough. It took Laurie 10 years to progress from Ward 21 to Ward 19. But it's taken Stephen only one lapse, lasting a matter of seconds, to get back to Ward 21. At lunch on this day, he lost his temper and threw a chair at another patient. So now he's back. You note that the privileges are significantly greater than in Ward 21, but it's still high security, and in some subtle ways, even more limiting than prison. Laurie has experienced both, and for him, there's no such thing as friendship here. It's very hard to have any social activities going or any other type of activity because the patients are unaware of what to do, sort of, you know. Everyone li lives in a sort of isolated world of their own. Oh, no. Hey, Johnny. Go on. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't hey, eat the flowers. He the builds them up. Don't worry about it. You're afraid to a certain extent to become too emotionally involved with other patients because they drain everything out of you. Uh, you have two boxes of matches, please. Give me one break. You can give them a cigarette or buy them a Coca-Cola or something, and that's as far as your relationship goes. Hey, Alan. Well, it's a bit of uh, chocolate. Peace, Charles. Uh, Thanks for that, sir. Wonder. No, you have it. Pal. What is it? No, it's just a flat one. He, what? Yeah, I, I'm done now. I've only got one pair, see? I'm supposed to fly? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm finished. But you, you hang on to it, pal. I can hang on to it. Yeah, it's yours, sir. You don't want me to do no, it. No coming at all. No worries at all, sir. Don't put them on. No. Don't no. have to worry me. You're right, pal. She's new. Don't worry about it, sir. <clears throat> no, it's far better than me. I don't want to take home an extra one thicker one there because they take it straight off in the middle of the night and it disappears. I don't know whatever the ever happens to it. I, I would never, ever know. <clears throat> Bet there's money in it for you. You'll, you'll do some good. Yes, yeah, some people are grotesque. Their behaviour's ridiculous. Their, their, their speech is disgusting or un, unintelligible or whatever. But you have to look past that. Otherwise, if that's all you see, I don't think you can do your job at all. <coughs> looks, looks like a big device. What does it do? The camera, Tim. Doesn't make me tired. Yeah. No, it won't make you tired. <coughs> what he said, it will. Can I, can I go on minimum tiredness, please, Bruce? 
A lot of people are put here because they've upset someone in the community or because they're different to a degree that they alarm someone. And if, if that's all you see as a nurse, then your, your reaction to those people is going to be just so wrong. It's going to be the same as the people they've come here to, to gain asylum from. Anyone behind you there, Bill? Three, Confidence in institutions like Morissette lies directly in their ability to keep violent patients effectively locked up. Escape from wards like 21 or even 19 mean big trouble. But in some of the other wards, it's not so unusual to have someone abscond. Can you ring up and get a car? Mark's wandered out through the back court. Right up. Hello, Jill. Hey Mark, where'd you get to, mate? I don't know. You went for a walk, did you? Eh. Yeah. Would the voices get the better of you, yeah. mate? Yeah. You want to hop in, Mark? Yeah. Come on, mate. And you were on your way back, were you? Yeah. Oh, well. Do you remember what made you run off? Back again, mate. Right? Come and see us next time you feel like running off, Mark. No. Hey. Yeah. Life wouldn't be interesting if we didn't do silly things. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> Mark is a problem because after 14 months in Ward 13, he's not getting any better. As can happen in psychiatric treatment, there's no apparent answer except to keep up the medication. Okay. Nurses must live with the fact that many of their patients may never be any better. And even the attempt to stabilise their condition can be dangerous because if it takes too long, the patient can become institutionalised. Some of the most chronic cases are the alcoholics who have so destroyed parts of their memory that each night they need to be shown where their beds and lavatories are. I'm glad you worked that out for me. Okay, it's your bed, Joe. Yes, I'm here. Any smokes in Smoking at night, for these people, of course, is simply too dangerous. Where's your matches? And your baggie, yeah. That's it. That's it. Right on. You know, I'm just going to get into bed now. It's late and Mark is safely in bed asleep. Tonight, Ward 13 has 22 men and only two women. Morris has had one new admission, but for the time being, has lost Stephen to Ward 21. Peggy is showing signs of moving from her depressed state into her manic state, but right now she is stable and peaceful. John's battle with authority and boredom is over for one more day. His crutches lie beside his bed. The ward at last is quiet. Tomorrow is another day. Morning, gents. Good morning. Rise and shine. Agree the new day dawning. There will always be Ward 19s and 21s in this world. Society needs to be able to lock away those members whose behaviour becomes a danger to themselves or to others around them. Uh, this happens every second or third morning. It makes a hell of a smell. And as soon as all this sort of stuff, we're going to put up a bit, we're going to wash it every morning. 
Give me a little smell out. With this man, every couple of mornings he'll paint the walls um, with feces, urine, make puddles, tears the clothing up. For instance, there's, there's one right there. It's his underpants torn to threads. All that's got to go in the laundry. It's quite often happens in here. These people, at this time, have no place in society. Some have been rejected by families, some by other hospitals. Some even have been rejected by our prisons. John will probably remain in Morisset for the rest of his life, living in a world of his own, talking to himself and eating the clover. Men like John and George are unlikely to change their ways and allowances are made for them. A nice hot shower, a cup of tea and a biscuit. Huh? Come on. Come on. George, what are you doing with your, with your, with your pants? Come on, mate. Come on, Glenn. Come on, Glenn, mate. I'm talking now, mate. Huh? I'm talking now, mate. Put them on the bed. No, they're all right. Hey, don't have a lot of Come on, have a shower, mate. That's it. That's it. Come on. Come on, George. Take it along. Oh, Good on your mind. Here, look here. Here's your hat. Here. Here. Let me walk. Let me walk. Let me walk. Oh, I'll you. I'll with you. If all goes well, Laurie will gradually receive more responsibilities and greater positions of trust. If he can ever prove his behaviour is under control, he may one day graduate towards 17. If he'd been serving a murder sentence in jail, he'd probably be out by now. But doing Governor's pleasure, he could easily spend the next 10 years, or even the rest of his life, here. We are right. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Come on. Come on, Laurie. Nor does the future look good for Stephen. Today he will come out of Ward 21 and go back to 13. In a few days he will be released from the hospital. But not long after, the police will have cause to pick him up and he will be back in custody waiting to appear before the magistrate. And so the job falls mostly to the nurses, men like Les Wheeler and Morris Brown. The job is difficult, sometimes even dangerous. And if you measure job satisfaction, in terms of the patient's improvement, then mostly it's very little, and there are no medals. George doesn't like people interrupting his thoughts. He's very aggressive, very aggressive. He likes to fight. He used to fight from the old days. He thinks he owns the place, and he's invading his privacy, so he's, he's going to put him out. Mr. McDonald was wiping the table down, and apparently he might have touched it with a cloth or something. He was wiping the table down. And George is tired of it. Yeah, he's, going to, he's going to fight again. Bob likes to have a bit of a fight. He likes a bit of a fight. George likes to have a bit of a go as well, so they're entertainment, I suppose. But I think it keeps George alive to have a bit of a, a go. I don't think this is the answer to mental illness. It's probably far, far and removed from the, from the best answer, but it's the only answer we've got at the moment, and we have to, to do the best we can with what we've got. I don't think we do a bad job with what we've got. I hope our patients don't think we do too bad a job.
on 7 now for the Australian movie thriller The Cars That Ate Paris, starring Wendy Hughes and John Mellion. Followed at 10.15, more action on Big League Soccer. And then tomorrow night at 8.30, Patty Duke Austin stars in Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby, the spine-chilling sequel to the original blockbuster.